had more drive back then than I do now. And I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I feel like now I'm not chasing. I'm just kind of like trying to survive and be happy and enjoy, you know? Hi, I'm Nick and I'm here with Alessia Cara for the latest In Enemies In Conversation sessions. Well, you've just um, put out two new songs to uh, introduce us to the third album era. Uh, Sweet Dream and Shape Shifter. Um, why did you want to launch with two different songs? And why were these the right two to go with? Um, I think because I always feel as though my first singles or the first songs that people hear off a new project should be like, to some degree, a representation of what's to come sonically and lyrically. Um, and when I was listening to this whole project and when I you know, completed the whole track list, I realized that there was like two kind of running themes and two different sonics happening at once. And, um, you know, like sort of a before and after um, storyline, I guess, or thread. So I felt like it would be best to release two songs to represent like the different sonic sides of the album, which is like, you know, lighter um, sonics and more whimsical instrumentation versus you know darker more soulful instrumentation that you'll hear throughout the project but then also lyrically i feel like sweet dream represents the tumultuous um you know difficulties that i was going through in the first half of the year and then shapeshifter while it was actually the first song that i wrote for the project it kind of represents the more witty light-hearted um you know elements of the lyrics on this project so they're kind of like a yin and yang why did the album um, end up with this duality? Is it just because it is an accurate reflection of, of, of the time you've had? I was writing very chronologically for this project just because I had so much time, um, you know, in the last year to, you know, patch things out mentally and emotionally. And I just had a lot of time to, to be creative. So this album ended up kind of happening chronologically. Um, and I guess the track list is a little bit mismatched, but um, you can kind of hear the beginning um, versus the end, you know, of where I started versus where I ended up. Saying obviously as much or as little as you're comfortable with, what were the difficult times you were going through? I don't know if it would have happened had it not been for the pandemic or maybe it wouldn't ha have happened as quickly. Um, but it was definitely a lot of things that were sort of boiling over. Um, I, you know, been working nonstop since I was 18 years old, you know, for the last seven years. Um, and I think when you kind of go through that lifestyle and you, you go through the motions of every day, you tend to get really good at pushing things down. Um, and for me, I was just like, I guess neglecting myself and not taking the proper care of myself and not dealing with my anxiety, not dealing with my depression and not understanding any of my emotions, you know, and then it was suddenly 2020, the world kind of stopped and all of those things that I'd been pushing down just like completely boiled over and I was getting panic attacks every single day um, for hours and hours on end. I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, it was just a disaster and I just completely halted. Um, and I mean, now looking back, I think it was a good thing because I wouldn't have gotten the proper help. I guess as an artist who, you know, you've started out, um, as you said, in the last seven years and your career has had this amazing trajectory. It must be so hard for you to like take a break. Do you know what I mean? To kind of jump off the treadmill for a second because you must almost feel like, oh my God, I've got to do the next thing. I've got to keep the momentum going. Yeah, because for me, like, I, I sort of tend to deal with things by distraction. Like that's my way of getting through things is like plowing through it and being distracted and having something to do all the time. Like that makes me feel purposeful when I'm working. And, you know, I think my, my life is so immersed and my identity is so immersed in my job that when I didn't have that, it was difficult, you know, because I was like, well, what's the point of my life? Like, I'm not working. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sad all the time. Like, what is the point, you know? So it, it hit me pretty hard. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm extremely fortunate. My family was healthy. I, you know, know my job's going to be waiting for me when I'm back. But it was still difficult, you know, to find purpose within all of that stillness and deal with myself because I didn't really, I didn't know how to deal with myself. I didn't know how to label anything I was feeling. It was just kind of a mess. Um, but I'm glad that it happened. How did you get through that situation? Like, how did you begin to kind of heal and, and, and process what you were going through? Um, I think I just had to like hit a complete rock bottom where I realized like I don't want to live this way anymore and I couldn't live that way anymore. Um, so then I just like looked up the first therapist I found on. I just like was like, I'm going to go go through this full force and I started doing therapy like three times a week it was like a rescue mission for myself pretty much um and just 
decided to change the way that I was living, you know, change my sleeping pattern, change, you know, what I was ingesting, um, just everything, the way that I speak to myself. And that obviously wasn't an overnight change. I definitely have lapses. I'm still kind of figuring out how to, how to do that properly, but I sort of just had to hit like a wall. Um, and then it was either like you change the way you're living or you, you stop living. Like there, there's no other option, you know? So I had to, to get my stuff together. <laughs> As a songwriter, obviously you're used to kind of pouring your emotions and what you're feeling into the songs, but was that hard to kind of do that in front of another person with your therapist? Was that, did that take from getting used to? Yeah, it definitely did because there's a lot of shame that comes with, you know, being a person with privilege on paper um, and then feeling all these negative emotions because it can come across as ungrateful or it could come across as, you know, just like taking things for granted, right? Um, so I wanted to be very mindful of that. And it was it was weird. It felt really shameful, like telling a therapist, like, you know, I have a lot of uh, success and a lot of money and, you know, everything's great. My parents are still together, but I just feel sad. Like, well, what do I do? You know, I just didn't, it felt stupid, you know, to, to say out loud. And that was kind of a reason, one of the big reasons why it took me so long to like really um, deal with it, you know, cause I was like, well, you're just being stupid or you're just being ungrateful. Um, but you know, one of the things you learn is that you, you can't feel shame. Shame is a very pointless emotion because it gets you nowhere, you know, and it sits there and you can't do much with it. You don't, you can't do much with guilt. You can't do much with shame. So you got to get rid of those feelings, especially when it's, you know, you realize it's not your fault. You mentioned uh, earlier in the interview that, you know, you've been doing this at least in a way that we've seen for the last seven years. How do you think you've changed as an artist and a person since you came out with here back in like 2015? Oh man. <laughs> um, in some ways I feel like I've stayed the exact same. Um, but then, I mean, I, I, I do feel like I've changed in, in a bunch of other ways. I feel like now, especially coming out of the pandemic, I have a new perspective, I think, on, on what I do. And I realized, you know, how much I enjoy what I do, especially when I, couldn't do it, um, you realize how lucky we are to do what we do. So um, I definitely have a new perspective. I feel like I'm, I don't know, a lot more um, firm in my beliefs and in saying no. I think saying no has become easier over the years as I come into myself as a woman and as a songwriter and artist. Um, so I just think I kind of have more of tunnel vision on, on who I am. And I think with every album I do, I'll be like, you know, constantly sculpting and, and shifting and adjusting that means for me but um I kind of have a clearer view now than I did years ago that's for sure but um I'm a lot more relaxed too I always found that I used to be more I had more drive back then than I do now and I don't know if that's a good or bad thing but I feel like now I'm not chasing I'm just kind of like trying to survive and be happy and enjoy you know instead of like feeling like I need to prove myself all the time you know why do you think you are more relaxed? Is it because you do feel you have proved yourself? Is it the success that's kind of helped you kind of chill out a little bit more with your career? Not, not necessarily, because I, I do feel like to some degree there's always going to be a level of having to prove myself just because I'm a woman and young. And um, I don't know. I feel like if you feel like you've reached the top of the mountain, you're just never going to try, you know? So I don't see it that way. But I, I think because I've had so many times that were so difficult for me where it felt like just living was difficult and existing was difficult enough. Now that I'm on the other end of that to some degree, I just am just so happy to be okay that I, I don't know, you, it puts things into perspective for you. You realize what matters and what doesn't, you know, when you kind of go through those hard times. So I'm just happy to be fine. And I just want to do things that I enjoy because I've been on the other side where I ha wasn't enjoying anything, you know, and I knew how, terrible that felt so I'm just glad to be here now. <laughs> when I uh, interviewed you for the first time which was back in 2016 and it was at the exact house you're sitting in now. Back then I asked uh, how you saw your purpose as an artist and you said to show people it's okay to be different. Do you still feel that way? Do you still feel like that's mm -hmm. your purpose? Hopefully there are multiple purposes for my music but ultimately now I, I just want to be able to like hold up a, a mirror to people, you know, whatever that means for them. Um, I mean, of course, like hopefully they learn something about me, but mostly I just want them to learn things about themselves and, and just know that there's like always, there's always someone in your boat, you know? Um, I very much believe in the, the strength and power in numbers and the comfort in numbers um, more so than I believe in like the comfort in finding results and answers. You know, it's, it's so much easier to feel like you're like, 
syncing with other people <laughs> rather than mm -hmm. alone. So as long as, you know, people can get that sense from, from what I do and maybe learn something new about themselves, that's, you know, that's more than fulfilling enough. So, yeah. When you're working on a new project and writing songs, as you have been obviously over the last year or so, is there ever, could you ever write a song that feels like too personal, too raw to put out? Or is there no such thing as you, is like a super raw song, one that you want people to hear? That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, so far I haven't written any that I've felt like I needed to hold back on. Um, there are things on this record that are definitely scary, um, but I feel like they're necessary because again, like when I was going through like the hardest times, all I would do was like Google keywords to try to find someone, like some sort of forum where someone was like going through a similar thing, you know, like I was so desperately looking for, again, just that comfort in numbers, right? So as scary as it is for me to talk about certain things, I know that it's going to be useful, you know, and I originally wrote it for me, but I think they songs become repurposed once you release them, you know, so it is scary, but I feel like it's necessary. Um, and if there's ever something I feel like is sort of a selfish song that is just for me to purge feelings, I probably wouldn't put it out, I guess. Or maybe I would, I don't know. Because I feel like to some degree, everything is useful to someone else, you know? Every feeling is useful to someone else. Have you ever had experiences where fans have told you that a song's useful to them and, and the way it's been useful is like, just not in any way what you were expecting when you write the song? Because I guess the thing is with music is, you write it from a certain place, it's about something that you went through, but you never quite know how, how people are going to kind of interpret it and apply it to their own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. That happens. That happens all the time. Um, and I mean, that's great. I feel like that's the best case scenario. Cause again, like it's, it's holding up a mirror to someone. It, they like are seeing themselves in it in a totally different way. So I, I, I love that, but it definitely happens a lot. Like even with here, my first song, it was just honestly about a party I didn't enjoy. I felt uncomfortable there, but people just turned it into like this song for introverts and they felt seen and it, they made it so much deeper than I even originally knew it could be, you know, and, or that I intended it for it, for it to be. Um, but I think that's when I realized like, wow, the music really does that for people, you know? So it definitely gave me a new view on, on what I do and how I do it. Was that hard to process though in the moment that this song you'd written had become this huge thing that you weren't expecting? Um, a little bit. Yeah. Because I, I felt like it made me, it gave me like a, a soapbox that I hadn't intended to like stand on. Like, it, you know, it was like, Oh, now I, I'm like speaking for all the introverts in the world, which is wonderful. But then, you know, I, I find now that I've, you know, grown into myself and I'm not so much of an introvert anymore. Um, you know, I, I feel like I still have to speak for that group of people. And people sometimes are like, oh, well, you've changed because you used to be this way. Now you're this way. And it's like, that's, that's what kind of comes, unfortunately, with being put in a certain box, you know, um, as people expect you to, to stay that way forever, because they need, they need a voice and like, they need a vessel, right? So they, they claim you as that vessel. Um, so for a while, it felt like I had to constantly speak from that perspective, um, even if I wasn't feeling that way anymore. But um, I don't know. I, I still ultimately feel like I'm the same person. We just all grow and we change and that's, that's okay. You know, we can't always feel the pressure to stay the same. Do you feel like a role model or is that not something that you like being told? <laughs> um, I mean, it's definitely flattering. It is a kind of scary because I feel like, you know, a lot of my fans are the same age as me, mm -hmm. um, going through the same phase of life as me. And I certainly do not feel like I'm in any way qualified to, <laughs> guide people <laughs> through life but um I don't know I mean we we learn things from each other so I, I can learn from them and maybe they can learn from me I don't know but it is definitely a big title that I I feel like I um am in no way qualified for we've spoken a lot about you know you putting what you've been going through into your songs and Sweet Dream is about insomnia um how that affect your life over the last year? Did it just kind of intensify everything else you were going through or was it like part of the root cause, do you think? Um, I think it definitely intensified everything. I, I was not aware until I started getting help um, and learning about this, that how much sleep um, played a part in anxiety and mood and just the way that you feel in general all the time, you know, like physically, it's, it's just like, like the like catalyst for every 
other thing, you know? And I, I just didn't know. I didn't know that sleep had that much of an effect on your life. And it was, it explained a lot of the way I was feeling. I um, mean, I think once I started to correct that, I could kind of see everything else follow but um you know once that was at its worst everything else was at its worst and it's just like a vicious cycle um because when you're anxious you sleep less but then when you sleep less you're more anxious so it's just like a continuous cycle that was insanely difficult for me um it just led to like constant panicking all the time and then i it became like something where I was like afraid of going to sleep at night because I knew I was going to have a panic attack. So then just nighttime and darkness in general became scary for me. It was like just phobia on top of phobia and it just grew. Um, and it felt like I was just like running from it, um, all the time. But yeah, once I understood the root of what was happening to me, the, the more, the better I was able to pick it apart and like, um, I guess, calm it down, if that makes sense. Can you, is it something you can manage? Because I've got friends who are insomniacs and it, 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 some, it seems like it's something that you can, you can improve and have good periods, but it's kind of hard to kind of stop it from popping up again, basically. I think for me, it was just difficult to like turn my brain off or for a lot of us, I feel like that's the, the root of it is, is knowing when to just relax your brain and stop the worrying. And, and um, I do so many things for me. It's like, and for a lot of us, it's like a recipe of different things. Like you got to start your sleep routine an hour to two hours before you even get into bed. It's like you, I, I take hot baths. I wear blue blocker glasses. I like set a worry time before bed where I like literally give myself like half hour to worry nonstop. But then when, by the time I get in bed, I'm like, okay, no more worrying. Like I, I've done the worrying before bed that way. Like, bedtime is strictly for sleep. You've yeah. worked uh, on the album, uh, including on Shapeshifter, one of the first two songs you put out with Salam Remy, who is known, among other things, for working with um, Amy Winehouse. And as I understood it, you actually did some writing in a, a room where Amy had, had written back in the day. Was that... Um, I know you're obviously a, a massive uh, Amy Winehouse fan. I seem to recall that in your bedroom wall you have a photo of her. Um, was it... Mm -hmm strange writing the same room as her was it very inspiring was it a bit of both um i think it was a bit of both yeah it was i think first and foremost i mean it overwhelmingly um i don't know how to explain it. it it was just it was just an overwhelming feeling one because i mean i had you know she's the she's the reason i started writing music in the first place so it felt like a full circle moment to some degree and then the other side of it just it just like gave me chills it was such a visceral feeling being I don't know it felt like she was her presence was still lingering there you know um but I think that kind of fueled the song and it helped me get into a, a zone of honesty and almost writing from a place of like thinking of the way that she would have done it in a sense you know and uh, it allowed me to be more honest than I probably would have been had I not thought of her um when writing that song so I'm glad that I that I did but it, it felt very full circle and um, it wasn't lost on me how big of a moment that was. On um, July 23rd, it was a ten year, the 10-year anniversary of Amy's passing. I'm just wondering, as someone who was so deeply inspired by her, has your relationship with her as an artist changed over the last 10 years? Um, having, I guess, you know, now become a successful artist in your own right, do you find you relate to her in a different way to you did, you know, 10 years ago? Um, definitely, yeah. I think I'm able to connect with her at a level that I wouldn't have when I was, you know, 10 or 11. Um, her, her sentiments surrounding love and pain, um, I totally see myself in now, even, even as a kid, but now, you know, having gone through heartbreak and, um, you know, levels of loneliness that I wouldn't have otherwise felt had I not, you know, been my age doing what I do for a living, you know? So I definitely see myself so much more than I used to in her words. And I think, you know, the more I go through life and the more I experience, the more I will connect with what she says. But yeah, um, I mean, and even just like admiring her simplicity and her as a, as a person, just watching her interviews and, and he, hearing her sing and watching her live performances, just being able to admire so much more. From Amy Winehouse to a very different artist, uh, Metallica. Um, you've recorded a version of End to Sandman for the, um, Black Album box set. What made you want to take on that song in particular and how on earth did you approach it? <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, well, I mean, they, they reached out to me. You know, I, I don't know why they would have chosen me for this or why they thought Alessia Cara when they thought of Black Album, but I'm very honored. Um, and I actually, I partnered with um, these amazing girls from Mexico. They, they formed a band called The Warning, um, and they're an amazing heavy metal band. And the, the reason they got discovered is because of their cover of Enter Sandman. And so when they, you know, reached out to me to maybe do this collaboration with them, they asked, you know, would you want to do specifically Enter Sandman? Because that's the song that we kind of started with. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, sure, let's let's do this together. And I, I loved the idea of working with a an all-female metal band because I feel like there's, you know, not as much female or women representation in the rock world. So I thought doing that collaboration with them would be awesome. And um, also I thought it was kind of fitting because I have Sweet Dream and I referenced the Sandman in Sweet Dream. So I felt like it was, um, you know, kind of serendipitous or I tried to think of it that way. Um, and we came up with this rendition that's, you know, kind of half metal, but half in my lane that feels a little bit more stripped and we tried to make it contemporary, but at the same time, you know, maintain the essence of, of the song. So hopefully we did it justice. They, they, you know, gave us their stamp of approval. So that's what matters to me. I'm glad that they enjoyed it. Do you think it's going to surprise your fans when they hear it? I think so. Yeah. Cause it, it's very different from what I am used to doing, you know, um, and what they're used to hearing from me. So definitely, but, but it was fun. It was fun to step into that role and, and dip my toe into that world, you know? Yeah, I think it's good to keep your fans on the toes as well. Mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been so good to talk to you again. Bye.